Okay, I think we're live. I'm just going to wait a second just to make sure this pulls up. Can anybody see me out there? Let me know. I'll just wait a few couple minutes before we get started. Let me know if you guys are there. I am live from Colorado on Throat Scope's Facebook page. I'm so excited. And we'll just wait a few minutes. Oh, I see a like already. Okay, so we're live. It's working. <laughs> Let me know if you guys are out there. Um, I think I can see comments here. Oh, perfect. This is actually my first live, you guys. Um, I'm Amy Graham. If you don't know me, I am a speech pathologist in Colorado, and I am so excited to be doing this live event today on the Throat Scope um, Facebook page. So we'll wait just a few more minutes. Um, I don't want to get started right away in case we want to wait for some people to join. Oh, good. I see. I see at the corner where people are are starting to attend. That's awesome. So I just want to thank before we get started. Hi, Jenny from Mississippi. Thanks for joining us. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Throat Scope for letting me do this. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, I had the pleasure of actually meeting Jennifer Holland. In, uh, and her throat scope team at ASHA um, in Orlando this last fall. It was so great to get to know her and just, I've used the throat scope um, for, I think I've had it for probably four years, I wanna say, whenever um, ASHA was in Los Angeles. That's when I bought it, it's when I first heard of it and I thought this is a brilliant product. Um, and hi guys, oh good, we've got Miriam, Monica, awesome. Jen, Sunny, hi guys. Oh, thanks for watching. I'm glad you're here. Um, okay, so I'll just get, get started. So um, I am a speech pathologist, um, speech language pathologist in um, Colorado, in Colorado Springs. Hi guys, welcome. Um, I basically, I created a, an oral facial exam because here in my private practice, and I have a, a small private practice, and it's just me, I'm a sole practitioner, but um, I specialize in speech sound disorders. And so a huge part, a key part of our assessments when we do speech sound disorders assessments is an oral mech, an oral facial, oral peripheral, whatever you call it. And so, um, I know we've all learned in graduate school, if I have a, I'm assuming I've got a lot of SLPs watching. Um, in graduate school, we know that that's a big part of assessment, especially when it comes to differential diagnosis. But, you know, we usually just kind of go back to our notes in graduate school, or maybe you had a really great textbook that kind of told you all the different things you need to look at um, for an oral facial exam. But none of them were really comprehensive and easily put together and in a really nice checklist format. So about a year ago, I thought I'm just gonna make my own and, and make it for me. Um, and for what I really think every SLP should be looking for and what I wanna really look for in order to rule out um, underlying functional or structural deficits that might be impacting kids' speech sound production. Hi guys, I'm just looking, making sure I don't have any questions yet. Okay, great. Um, and so I developed my oral facial exam and I was so excited um, about this, about working with Throat Scope because we now actually have a bundle that is for sale on the Throat Scope website that includes my oral facial exam, which I'm going to go through the whole thing tonight. And I, I laminated mine, but um, in the bundle, you actually get um, a Throat Scope starter pack and then a box of 50 one time use depressors that go with the throat scope and you get um, a downloadable PDF of, uh, sorry there's a glare, <laughs> a downloadable PDF of my oral facial exam. So I want to show you exactly what's in this oral facial exam and then also in the climate that we're in now we're probably going to have to be looking at doing some of our assessments via teletherapy, via telepractice. So I know that we're used to kind of getting in our kids' faces and getting in there and looking and seeing exactly what's going on with the oral mechanism, but we can't really do that right now. And so I'm going to talk about ways that you can incorporate different tasks for this oral exam of mine um, into telepractice. So, okay, we've got more people here. Hi, everybody. Awesome. Okay, so 
Um, let's see. So anyway, I just want to back up a little bit in case I'm, I'm, I don't want to assume that everybody is a, a, um, an SLP, a speech language pathologist or SLT, speech language therapist. So specializing in speech sound disorders, I'm working with kids who have anything from a single sound error, maybe just a lisp, maybe they have trouble with producing the R sound, um, all the way to phonological errors in their errors. So maybe they, their S's and their F's always turn into like a T or a P, always. And so there's a pattern with, with their, um, their speech errors all the way to the more severe side of the scale, which is was, would be like apraxia of speech. So children with motor planning issues to where um, the brain has difficulty coordinating the movements for speech. So in order for us as SLPs to differentially diagnose and to know exactly how to treat this child and what specific type of speech sound disorder they have, we have to different, differentially diagnose them. And a big part of that, a big piece of that, um, that assessment is doing an oral facial exam because it can give you very valuable information to help us as SLPs differentially diagnose so that we can actually treat more appropriately. So that being said, um, I'm going to get started. I'm going to go through each little piece of this oral facial exam that we should be looking at and then also talk about how you can possibly do this over telepractice. All right, and feel free if you wanna ask questions um, over on the side, feel free. And as I see them, I will, um, I will try to answer as best I can. Okay, so I'm just gonna put my stuff down. So I have a little helper tonight. My daughter is here <laughs> because she, this is my little one. This is the littlest one I have. She's not super little anymore. This is Lindsay. Say hi, hi Lindsay. <laughs> so she is um, 11 and we know this is kind of on the older end. Here, Lindsay, can you scooch over this way a little bit? Yeah. There we go. This, she's kind of on the older end of kids that we're going to be assessing for speech sound disorders. So likely, so she's going to be really an easy one to be able to, to assess over telepractice. Um, the littler ones can be a little tricky. And we know it's not ideal because, like I said before, some of these tasks you want to assess even strength, and that's really difficult to do over telepractice. There are other tasks that you absolutely can complete. And then if you have to put a strength task away and just say, okay, well, when I'm able to see you in person, hopefully in a couple of months, then we can go back and check that off the list. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I pressed the wrong button. Okay. I'm still up. We're good. Okay, so we're going to go down the list of my oral facial exam right here. And I want to remind you, too, because I get a lot of questions from SLPs about how do I know what's normal? How do I know what, you know, how do I know if there's something that's troubling? And I have two, two answers to that. The first is, well, actually three. <laughs> go back. You may have to actually go back and review some of your anatomy books, some of your anatomy notes, if you kept any of them, like I did. Um, and also you um, should practice. So if you have your own kids, nieces, nephews, neighbors, friend, friends, children, practice on with as many kids as you can because you don't really know what typical looks like until you kind of get an idea about what most kids oral structures look like because there is kind of a, a wide variety of what typical is. So practice on as many kids as you can. Um, that will help you feel more comfortable when you know, like maybe a high palate versus just a, a very average looking palate, something like that. So that's just one example. And whoop, I dropped my notes. I'm going to pick these up. Sorry for a second. Um, and then the other thing is, um, well, well, we'll just, let's just get started. <laughs> so I'm going to um, actually talk about the first part of this assessment. So the first part up here is we're going to look at the face. And this is really easy to do over telepractice because it's just your observation of the child. <clears throat> Lindsay's face, there's a few things on my assessment that I'm looking for. I'm looking for symmetry. Is there any drooping on one side or the other? And then in my um, oral facial exam too, in the back, there's about four pages that kind of walk you through what each of those things can mean and help you um, interpret maybe some of the findings and interpret what you're seeing. So for example, on page one, it says face, you're looking for symmetry. Is it within normal limits? Or is there drooping on either the left? Is it within normal limits or is it hypo or hyper? So like if you see a child 
Um, and they're just kind of got those little pudgy cheeks that are so cute, but they just look like a, they've got a little hypo tone, so there's not enough tone. Maybe they're drooling, and that could be an indicator of something that you might need to um, assess other, maybe th there could be other weaknesses going on. So just because you have low tone, though, doesn't mean necessarily that you will always see um, weak muscles for speech. That just means that their, their muscles at rest are not tensed very much. So it's just something to keep in mind. So you're looking at the face basically. And that's, like I said, it's easy to do over telepractice um, because you're just observing the child. So the next part is, um, of the face that I observe is mouth breathing. Because if you see a child, and you can see Lindsay is not mouth breathing, she's breathing through her nose. But if you see a child that looks kind of like this, I'll demonstrate. And they're just kind of breathing through their, their mouth all the time and their tongue is a little bit forward and maybe sometimes sticking out um, just at rest, that is one of those big red flags for myofunctional disorders. So it's one of those things you definitely want to take note of. And um, within the context of your entire speech assessment, it's, it just, you have to keep in mind all of these different red flags that might jump out at you um, as you do this oral facial exam. So that is what I look at regarding the face. The next part is right here, whoop, and it's jaw, and I know, I'm sorry, it's with being um, laminated, I think it's a little shiny, so forgive me, but um, this is all in the oral facial exam, which I should mention is basically three pages, so it's this first page, um, this second page, which we'll go over, and then I have the last page, but then there's four additional pages of explanations, diagrams, to kind of help you understand what you're looking for and what you might, might be seeing. So the next thing is the jaw that we're gonna assess. So what I like to do is I look at two aspects of the jaw. The first is during non-speech tasks, so I'm just gonna ask Lindsay to Open your mouth really big for me. Oh, nice job, Lynn. Close it. Open big again. <laughs> and I'm going to look in the video. <laughs> I'm not going to address her face to face because I want you to see. She's looking at me in the video. I'm looking at her because I want this to simulate the telepractice as, as much as possible. So what I'm looking for there, too, is any asymmetries. Um, if there are any asymmetries, even like if you back up to the face, if maybe one side is drooping, then that's something to note as well and take that into consideration. If there is asymmetry there, it could be an indicator of neurological involvement. So the next thing we're looking at um, for that jaw is uh, the range of movement. So can she open her mouth really wide? You did. Open it big. Nice job. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Good job. Um, and then the next thing is um, I'm going to ask her a question. Um, let's see, Lindsay, what is your favorite candy, Lens? Um, Probably Milk Duds. Why do you like Milk Duds? Because it's chocolate and caramel. Oh, those are my favorites too. And what I'm doing there is I'm observing her jaw movement during speech. Now you're looking for jaw sliding, like maybe on a, on a certain phoneme. So if you see this like this, that's a jaw slide. And so I didn't see any jaw sliding with her because if you see some jaw sliding and you take into consideration the type of speech errors they have, maybe they're doing a lateral lisp, um, maybe they're having other trouble with other lingual phonemes, and if their jaw is sliding, that could mean they're having trouble dissociating their tongue from their jaw. So that might be something you might have to look at and incorporate into your therapy too to work on. So that's what I look at regarding the jaw. Um, and that the next thing on the list of the oral facial exam right here is dentition. And you can see so far you can do all of this via teletherapy, no issues yet, right? Okay, so Lindsay, can you smile really big for me? Nice job, and I'm, what I'm looking for is crowding or spacing of those teeth. And those teeth look pretty straight. It's not really big for me, good, love it. And you're also going to wanna to look to see if they're wearing any braces <laughs> and if they have any appliances in their mouth. So I'm going to get the throat scope. This is where this comes in handy. So now, Lynn's before, um, if the, now, when we're in person with the child, this is so much easier to use, right? I would recommend seeing if you can get one to the parent, especially if you have a younger child and the parent needs, the parent needs to be right there with us anyway, right? If we're going to do, be doing telepractice, which by the way, I haven't started yet. Next week I have for telepractice. So 
this is a big learning curve for me too. I, we're, I think a lot of us never thought we would be teletherapists and we're just kind of figuring this out. <laughs> so as I'm this out as well. Um, but if there's any way for you to get the parent this uh, throat scope, you're gonna see how much easier it can make your life <laughs> by seeing, being able to look in her mouth. Now, Lindsay, if, so if we didn't have this, I'm gonna show, um, show you how dark it can be. Lindsay, can you open your mouth really big? I wanna see your teeth. Okay, and look up for me. Okay, now can you look to the side? Can you close your mouth? Smile really big, like this, and look over that direction. Keep going, keep looking to the side. I wanna see the side of your face, nice job. And what I'm looking for there is malocclusions. So we know um, a type two malocclusion is an overbite. A type three malocclusion is an underbite. And so it's something to note too, because maybe if they're having particular trouble with phonemes, malocclusions possibly could play a role in that. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to stop therapy until their teeth are fixed or till their bite is fixed, um, but it's something that you have to keep in mind because maybe you're gonna need to teach um, some workarounds for them to produce per particular sounds um, or comp compensatory strategies. There you go, that's the word I was looking for. But if she has the um, throat scope, you're, we're gonna look and see how much easier it is to look into her mouth. And what I'm going to look for too is any um, palatal appliances. So Lindsay, I'm gonna give this to you. Can you open it, open your mouth really big and stick it on your tongue. Stick that on your tongue and then look up to the ceiling for me. And, oh good, can you look even higher? Put your head even back further. Even back further, nice job. Look how that lightens up her palate. Awesome, good job, thank you. <laughs> and you can see how that just totally lightens up her palate. You can see so, so well into her. I mean, you gotta look in, into these kids' mouths. You can't, can't just assume that, oh, it's just a lisp, it's just an R sound. You have to know what's going on because there could be something structural or functional or extra like an appliance that could be impacting their ability to produce whatever target sounds they're working on. Um, the next thing we're gonna look at um, on my list right here is the pharynx. And it's, I'm gonna point right, <laughs> right there. We're gonna look at the pharynx, the color of the pharynx, so the back of the throat, and we're gonna look at the tonsils. Now this, you can actually see really well. If the child has this on the other side of the screen, I want you to, Lindsay, see if you can get your face really close. Do that again, laying this on your tongue and see if you can find your own tonsils. Can you find your own tonsils? And say, ah, ah. Uh, Ooh, nice job, do it again. Ah. Uh, nice, <laughs> that was really good. Now, it might be a little tricky to see, but if you can kind of, if mom is there or dad is there and they can kind of help that child look into the camera and see in the back of their throat, um, then you can see if they have um, large tonsils, no tonsils, and what I've included on my oral facial exam is the Brodsky scale right here, and I even have um, this diagram right here so you can see what size those tonsils, and you can actually grade these tonsils because if you have a child, and this is all in the context of what type of speech sound errors you're hearing from the child. So maybe they have really large tonsils, but the only thing they're doing is gliding. Is it impacting their speech? Probably not. And they're very hypo-nasal, so there's not enough air getting into that nasal cavity in order to make their nasal sounds really nice and have good resonance in that nasal cavity. So if you see big tonsils and you hear hyponasality, that is um, a good reason to refer to a pediatric ENT to look to see if there's any, their adenoids might be big, which we can't see adenoids, right? They're up, up behind that soft palate, so we can't see that, but an ENT can. So that would be a good hyponasality, so if they sound like they're stuffed up all the time, and their ebbs sound like Bs, and their eds sound like Ds, like that, that's hyponasality. And if you see big tonsils, then you gotta refer. And the Brodsky scale can help in your report refer to what, um, what's, what number on the scale you're actually seeing. So I have all this and a big explanation on the last pages too that kind of walk you through that. The next thing we're gonna look at is hard and soft palate, which is a whole section down here. Now what you're looking at is the color, first of all. So I'm gonna hand this back to Lindsay. It's another reason that I, I would love for the parent on the other side of the screen to have one of these so you can look in their mouth. Lindsay, can you do that again? Let's look mm -hmm. at your palate. Lay it on your tongue, look up into the, at the ceiling for me. And it might be a little tricky to see the color over the screen. Good 
based on what we're hearing with their speech um, and say, you know what, this is, I think this is what I'm seeing, but I really need to wait until we see the child in person, maybe in a couple months from now or whenever you can. Um, but you still should be looking there. So if you see like a white or translucent kind of coloring here, I'll take it <laughs> um, to that, to that hard palette and you hear hypernasality, that could be a, a big red flag for a submucous cleft, um, which basically means that bone under the, the soft tissue has not completely come together, um, and it, that can cause um, velopharyngeal dysfunction. So it's definitely, if you hear hypernasality, and you see those things like, some, if you suspect a submucous cleft, that's a good reason um, to refer to a, um, a craniofacial team or a, v, a VPI team um, at your local children's hospital. And I am no expert on each one of these diagnoses, but reach out to SLPs who are. So I mean, I've talked to the SLP on our VPI team, our craniofacial team, and I've gotten so much great information about when a good ref when would be a good referral. Um, and so reach out and talk to those SLPs who specialize. So we're also looking at not just color, but you're looking at um, arch height, so your palette height and the palette width, because if you see a really high palette and a really narrow palette, um, that's another red flag for a myofunctional disorder as well, because if you have a tongue um, that's resting on the bottom of the mouth, just when you're sitting there normal, like when we talked about earlier about a mouth, a child who mouth breathes, that tongue is not up against the palate. That tongue is resting low and forward in the mouth, most likely. And so it's not, doesn't have pressure against that palate to make it nice and wide over time. And so if that, if you see those high and narrow palates, it's another red flag for myofunctional disorders that you're going to probably want to um, observe or test more along those lines. The other thing you're going to want to look at is for, I have growths on here, fistulas. Sometimes we're the only ones or we're the first professionals that actually notice these things. So look in the mouth for a fistula um, and then the appearance of the uvula. So I have in the back a diagram under the guidelines of a bifid uvula. So if you see a uvula in the back of the throat that looks kind of like that, like it's notched, like it's an upside down heart, and you hear hypernasality, um, those bifid uvulas very often are signs of a possible submucous cleft. So there, that would warrant another referral for a craniofacial team because that needs to be ruled out by a team. So that's just something to note too. If you see a bifid uvula, now if you see a bifid uvula and there's absolutely no hypernasality, then I still note it, I still put it in the report. Um, but it may not warrant a referral because if there are no issues, if it's not causing any functional problems, then you may not need to have a referral right away. But always let the parents know what you see. Okay, the next thing we're looking for is symmetry at rest also. So you're looking at that soft palate again, and I'll have you put this in your mouth in just a second. And you wanna see um, if whether or not that soft palate is very symmetrical on either side of the uvula. And I'll show you why. I even have it right here. Um, the, uh, let's see, asymmetry of the velum, and I have it right here for you, um, at rest can sometimes be associated with various syndromes. So if you notice some of these things, like I said, we're on the front line sometimes of noticing these little red flags for possible syndromes, other medical diagnoses, that you can help parents actually discover and uncover. I've been a part of it sometimes. So when you see something, put it in your report, not to, you know, make parents um, afraid or nervous, but it's always, I, I feel like information, parents need to know this information, um, especially if it is impacting their speech on, on a functional level. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is actually, we're going to look at the soft palate during phonation. So Lindsay, I'm going to give this back to you. Okay. And I'm going to have you put it on your tongue again. And we're gonna look at your tonsils. We're gonna to look at the back of your throat, but I want you to say, ah, really loud. So yeah, there you Aww. go. Good job. And you're looking for that velum. And do you see how it moved up and back? Do it again, Lens. Ah. Nice job. And you see really good motility. So that's what you're looking for. Um, good motility of that soft palate during phonation as well. Um, because if you see, now if you see asymmetry, then that is something to note as well. That could be if, you, if only one side moves um, or what it pulls to one side, that would be the stronger side because that's the muscle that's con contracting. 
symmetries, right? Think back to all those neuro, neuro courses that we had to take. Um, you want to see posterior movement, lateral movement, uvula movement, and you saw all those things. And then if you don't see much movement and you hear hypernasality again in speech, there's a, there's, that warrants a referral to a craniofacial VPI team. Talk to your, um, the SLP on that team and tell um, him or her what you're hearing and ask if that's an appropriate referral. The ones that I've worked with say that it is. So um, that's always something to know. Now, if there's not much motility in that velum, but they're not hypernasal, then it's probably no big deal. But it's something to just note and keep in mind um, within the context of their speech errors. All right, so that is page one, you guys. And all of these things you can see, I'm talking a lot about it, but all it takes is kind of one look in the mouth for just a few seconds, have them say ah, and you can check all of these off really quick. So this is actually a very quick assessment. Okay, so the next thing you're gonna look at um, are lips. And this is another thing you can do via teletherapy. Um, and you can, what's, I really love the throat scope for this too, because I'm gonna ask um, Lindsay to do something for me. Okay, are you ready? Now I'm gonna look mm -hmm. in the screen. But we're gonna. We're gonna give mom a kiss on the cheek. Can you pucker for me? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good pucker. And what you're looking for is whether or not they actually require a model. Now, little ones might, because they're, maybe they're not sure what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But if they have a hard time doing that, those volitional tasks, um, especially given all the other tasks we're gonna have them do with their lips and their tongue, then those are big red flags. Model apraxia, and if they're highly unintelligible or they have trouble with multisyllabic words, um, then you probably are gonna wanna do a dynamic motor speech assessment because you want to see if apraxia is actually on the table for this child, and this will help with your differential diagnosis. Um, the other thing we're looking for when I have her pucker is range of motion, right? So that looked really good. Can you do that again for me, Lance? Mm -hmm. And we're looking for symmetry, and we're looking for strength. Now, the strength is the part that is gonna be tricky to do over teletherapy, but what I've had, um, what I would have the parents do is just put this against their lips. So pucker again, and you just push it and see if they can maintain that seal. And the nice thing about the throat scope is you can see through it, <laughs> so, and it lights up her lips. And she maintained a really good seal. And I like that activity better than actually holding it between your lips and trying to pull it out, because they usually just put their lips between their teeth and that doesn't measure lip labial strength anyway. So that's what we're looking at. Now the next task I have on here is directing her to smile. Can you smile really big for me, Liz? Lovely. Oh, that's really good. And what we're looking at there is whether or not, again, does she require a model? Does, does she have to see me do it first? Like, okay, smell really big like this. And she didn't. She had a, no problem with that volitional um, motor movement. So a pra, um, oral apraxy is not a concern right now. And then we're looking for range of movement. And then symmetry of movement is one side droopy. Um, and if you notice maybe a drooping face, um, if you notice in that velum before and you're seeing consistent asymmetries, those are definitely some red flags for neurological involvement, so keep that in mind. Um, okay, now I'm gonna ask you to do those two things, puckering and smiling, really fast, back and forth. Smile big, pucker, smile big, pucker, smile big, <laughs> good job. And the fact that she can do those back and forth rapidly with no trouble, no groping. You wanna be looking for groping too because if you suspect that a child has apraxia, um, they're gonna have trouble with those movements. They're, gonna, they're not gonna be very rhythmic. They're going to have, you know, you're gonna see, and by groping what I mean is like, do you see them trying to struggle to where, where to put those articulators? Are they going, they, they just qu can't quite get to where they need to go with those articulators or can they get there quickly and no problem at all. Um, so that's something to note too because if you see issues with that, that's oral apraxia guys. And then you really do need to do a motor speech, dynamic motor speech assessment. Apraxia. Now the next thing I'm gonna have her do, and this is easy for parents to do as well, is we're gonna blow air and hold air in your cheeks really tight. Can you hold air in your cheeks? Nice job, and I, I always get my little fingers, and I'm gonna try to get that air out. Don't let me get that air out. And there's two things I'm looking for here, is does she have a good labial seal? Are her lips strong enough to keep that air inside? And they were. And the other thing I'm listening for is any air escaping through the nasal cavity as well, because that could be another indicator of velopharyngeal 
air from the oral cavity like it should. So if you hear that, um, now that might be tricky to do over um, teletherapy, but like I said, if you don't suspect, if you don't hear any hypernasality in their speech, then it's probably not that big of an issue. But it's just something that if you do hear hypernasality, check it. See what you hear, see what you see what you think. Okay, now the next thing. So we're done with lips. That's it. Just those two movements and those different tasks that we're having them do. The next thing is the tongue. Okay, so now this is where the throat scope comes in handy too. Excuse me. So what you're going to look at is color. Now, keep in mind, too, over the video, color can be distorted. So um, most of the time, you know, there are rare occasions where the color, color is off, like you might see. And I even have um, in the guidelines portion of the oral facial exam, like when you're looking at color of the tongue, pinkish color is considered typical. Um, but sometimes if you see a creamy white coating, that could be oral thrush, geographic tongue, which is a benign condition you might see, which is, has a map-like appearance. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can see on that tongue that could be very benign, um, or it could be something that you might want to refer back to the pediatrician for too. So it's still something to look at. Um, the next thing you're going to look at, so I'm going to have you, Lindsay, can you stick your tongue out for me? Good job. Open your mouth really big and stick it out. Good. And sometimes you do, you still need this throat scope. So I'm going to have give that to you so you can hold it. And I want you to stick your tongue out again and shine the light on your tongue. Can you shine the light? Oh, nice job, excellent. And you're also going to wanna look for extraneous movements like fasciculations, um, are there any jerky movements? And then go back to those neuro books and remember what those mean, whether or not a referral is warranted. Um, and then size, and I've had kids too where their tongues are actually kind of large for their mouth. And so that doesn't mean that, oh my gosh, what do I do, do I refer? No, it just means you might have to teach compensatory strategies for some of those articulatory goals that they that those kids might have. All right, you can hold on to that lens. And then um, you're also going to want to look at the frenum, that little strip of tissue that runs from the base of the tongue to the floor of the mouth. So Lindsay, open up your mouth really big, keep it open, and try to touch the tip of your tongue to the roof of your mouth. Can you now keep hold that out? And just, yeah, just hold that for a second. And can you touch the tip of your tongue to the roof of the mouth? And I'll show you. So you can show them what this looks like. Lift it up. Really good. See if you can keep your mouth really, really wide open. Can you touch the roof of your mouth with your tongue? Mm -hmm. You can. Good. And then you can even shine a light and do it again. Good job. And you're looking to see if there's any restriction there. Now, there, we know that um, as SLPs, as it's a pretty controversial topic, tongue tie. Um, but you have a child with red flags for myofunctional issues and their tongue is tied. You don't have to put that up your nose. <laughs> if their tongue is tied, then that, listen, that might be impacting, most likely might be impacting their ability to put their tongue where it needs to be at rest. And if they're having those interdental productions of S and other alveolar sounds like T, D, L, you know, and their tongue kind of comes forward for all those sounds, even the D sound, and their tongue. <laughs> I'm trying my best. Um, then you might want to talk to the parents about the possibility of having that revised. Now, I'm not one that says every tongue tie needs to be revised necessarily because that's not necessarily what um, the current research is showing. Not that that won't change down the road, but it always impacts speech. Um, it's just something to keep in mind, and you have to A few kids too with single sound errors like ours who absolutely cannot tense their tongue or tighten their tongue or elevate their tongue posteriorly to get a really good R sound. And I've had a couple that I can think of in the last few years that only progressed in therapy after their tongue tie was clipped. So, I mean, it's just something to keep in mind. I don't feel it's not a hard and fast rule. If you see a tongue tie, yes, absolutely get it clipped, but do a thorough case history. Were there any feeding issues? Were there any nursing issues? Do they have sleep problems? Are there, are there snoring issues? I mean, there's a whole list of things which, by the way, SLPs, take a myofunctional course so that you can be aware of some of these red flags for um, what, my, what, what to look out for at the very least. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is I'm going to look at, um, as, she, as you can see, I had her do one and I can check off a bunch of things on my list. Excursion, was it with the normal limits? Yes. Did it deviate to the right or left? No. 
How was her range of motion? It was great. And the, uh, the only thing, like I said, is strength is going to be tricky to measure. This is how I would do it in person. So I'd have you stick your tongue out again for me, Lens. Stick it out. And I'm going to hold it this time. But I'm going to see if I can push against your tongue, stick it straight out. Now you're sticking it down. You see how down it is? Can you stick it straight out in front of you? And I'm going to push against it. And don't let me push it. Don't let me push it. Use your tongue. Good job. And you're testing for strength there. Now you're not going to be able to do that via telepractice. Now, and parents can do that, but I don't like to put that onto parents and ask them to be the expert because they're not. So I, I would I would probably hold off on the strength tasks, um, especially if you don't suspect dysarthria. So if you know their articulatory contacts are good, if their intelligibility um, isn't necessarily reduced, the long, you know if they don't have all those signs of dysarthria, and keep in mind, flaccid, spastic, mixed, ataxic, all those types of dysarthria as you want to keep in mind. If that's not a concern, then I'm okay with holding off on those strength exercises because I don't want to put that on the parents like, well, you said that they were strong enough or you said they were weak. They don't know. They're not the expert we are. So wait till you can assess that portion. The next thing is pull your tongue all the way back in your mouth. Can you open your mouth really big? And see if you can pull your tongue all the way back. Good job. And that right there as well will give you um, the ability to see if there's any asymmetries in that movement. And the next thing I'm going to have her do is stick your, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> we're getting, we're almost done. Um, I'm going to have you stick your tongue out and move it to just your tongue. Move it to this side. Can you move your tongue? Good. I know it's weird. <laughs> we're backwards on the screen. Now, can you move it to the other side? And can you go back and forth a bunch of times really fast? Nice. And what I'm looking for there is range of movement. And this is all on my oral facial exam. And I'm also looking to see if there is any, if there's difficulty with tongue jaw dissociation. I have a lot of kids with single sound errors that don't progress in therapy, like with R's or even with S's sometimes who just cannot move their tongue independent from that jaw. And so I need to back up and work on that. Um, usually within the context of speech, I, I almost hardly ever have to do non non speech tasks for that. Um, maybe the first five minutes, but then we put it right into speech tasks. Um, because they cannot move that tongue independent of the jaw. And if they can't, they're not going to have um, an easy time making or producing um, some of your, your phonemes that you're, you might um, be targeting with them. So that's what, what I'm also looking for. And if you're in person again, here's another strength exercise. So Lindsay, put your tongue straight out and then to one side. Put it over to one side. Which side do you want to go? Oh. This side or this side? Good. And I'm going to push against it. Don't let me push it to the middle. Keep it there. Now do it the other side. Don't let me push your tongue. And you're just kind of pushing to test to see if there's strength. And um, that looked really good, by the way. Good strength. <laughs> but again, that's something that you can, you can look at down the road when you're able to see the child in person. And then I have a tongue tip up, tongue tip down, and we test it the same exact way. All right. So that is, as far as um, the throat scope goes, that's exactly what I look for. And if you have trouble with... Um, Little ones, because I know sometimes, uh, although I've been, I, I've been surprised at what I'm hearing, sometimes the little ones do really well over the screen because it's kind of novel. Um, but I have this great book that if you have a child who's really apprehensive about opening their mouth or even having anybody put a tongue depressor in their mouth, however, this, we call it either the fairy wand or a lightsaber. And oh my gosh, kids that won't normally open their mouths for a regular old wooden tongue depressor have no problem with this because it's so cool and so fun. So the throat scope is my first tip for teletherapy um, and probably my biggest tip for telepractice if you have to do an oral facial exam. Give mom and dad one of these to have on the other side so you can get as much information as you possibly can. My next tip is, this is the coolest book ever. It's called Terrific Tongues. Um, I think if you guys follow, are on Instagram and follow Texas Speech Mom, she's the one who um, first talked about this because I had a child once who would not open her mouth for me at all. And so the only way she, I got her to do anything with her mouth was this cool book. And so it's basically, this a bunch of animals with different types of tongue like tongues like this one right here i don't know if you can see that um if you had a tongue like a party blower you might be a frog and then like oh can you make your tongue like a frog how would we do that and then you can have them just copy you and see if they can have that good range of movement you can get a lot of information by just doing some silly things favorite ones is if 
you might be a bat and a mop. How do you mop the floor with your tongue? Oh, let's go back and forth. Can we do that? And you can get a lot of information from this book. So this is a really, really cute book, um, Terrific Tongues. Um, oh, and I, I haven't even looked. Sorry, guys. I haven't even looked to see if I have any questions over here. I think I do have a couple. Um, so anyway, I, oh, yes, um, Mariana, I have read that the proper development of teeth, bite, jaw, and tongue must rest totally flat against the roof of the mouth. This can solve most of the problems regarding symmetry. Absolutely. I mean, unless there's something neurological going on, um, and that's why when we look at all of those little red flags for myofunctional issues, um, that is definitely something to keep in mind. If it's not pressing up against the roof of the mouth, you're going to have... Um, some definite myofunctional issues going on that need to be addressed as well. So yes, that is for sure. Let me see if there's any other questions. All right, I don't think I see any. Now the very last thing that I look at, which can give you a lot of information, are the didoco kinetic rates. And I have a chart here. And so if you're not familiar with doing that, the way that I love to test this is I have um, I just get my phone and I get my um, stopwatch. Let's see, reset right here. And so what I will do is we have a task. The first task is going to be puh. Lindsay, can you say puh for me? Puh. Good. And this is easy to do over telepractice. They just have to be able to imitate you. So, Lynn, say puh a bunch of times as quickly as you can. Can you do it? Good job. Now, when I say go, I want you to keep going until I say stop. Are you ready? Yeah. On your mark, and I'm going to press the start button on my stopwatch. And when she gets to 20 repetitions, I'm going to stop and then I'm going to mark down um, the seconds that it took her to get there. So, Linz, are you ready? Mm -hmm. On your mark, get set, go. Nice job. <laughs> and she got 4.3 seconds. And she is 11. I'm going to go right here. And she is, um, for 11 years old, 3.6 seconds is about the um, norm, but the standard deviation is 0. 0.6. So, ooh, we were a little bit outside of it, but I might have been a little off to measuring it. Mm. Might have been a little slow with my thumbs. But you can go down each one, pa, then ta, then ka, and then we're going to put them all together, pataka, 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 pataka. Kind of sounds like buttercup, right? Yeah. Or patty cake. Okay, so what I'm, to me, that is the, that will show us the most information. So, Linz, I'm going to ask you to say, can you try that? Put all three together, pataka. Pataka. Now, can you do it a little bit quicker for me? Pataka, 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 pataka. Pataka, 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 pataka. Good, I know it's kind of silly. And you might need to practice a few times before you get a really good reading. But, Linz, I'm going to ask you to say those quickly as many times as you can until I tell you to stop. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. On your mark. Get set. Go. Pataka, 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 pataka. Nice job. Okay, and that was, we're looking for 10, and she got those uh, just a little over four seconds, well within the standard deviation. And what you're looking for there is whether or not does it slow down over time. It could be an indicator of, of a dysarthria. And then it also, I even have considerations down here, guys, because sometimes you have all this information, and you're like, well, okay, what does that mean? What does that tell me? So on the oral facial exam, if they have a rate, for example, I'll look under this section right here, a rate more than more than uh, um, one and a half standard deviations outside the mean for the didoco kinetic rate, if that answer is yes, if there's poor rhythmicity, poor coordination, or groping dur during those DDK tasks, if your answer is yes, um, if there was groping during volitional movements during the whole task, um, the whole oral facial exam, and the answer is yes. If they're only to com only able to complete um, tasks upon imitation, and the answer is yes, those are all big red flags. You might need to consider um, an oral, a non-speech oral apraxia diagnosis, and then conduct a motor speech assessment. So it kind of walks you down through like, okay, what are you seeing? Are you seeing these multiple things? You might need to refer to um, an SLP who specializes in myofunctional disorders, or you might need to refer to a craniofacial team, or you might need to refer to a neurologist, or back to the pediatrician. So there's so much information that we can glean from this, um, not just for our own therapy purposes, but for purposes of appropriate referrals as well. So that is my oral facial exam in a nutshell.
comments. Um, what sources are the norms based on? Those norms are based on, and I have all the references in the back. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, trying, uh, it, I'm trying to think. It is right here. Um, the time by count measurement, uh, Fletcher, 1972, those norms haven't changed. So um, that's where I got the norms from, from the Journal of Speech and Hearing Disorders. But all of my references for everything in here is on the back page. So you're, you're by all means, go back and look at all of those. Um, I think I've answered all the questions. Any other questions for me, guys? Thank you. <laughs> I think we're done. So Throat Scope, thank you so much. I hope I've given you um, at least more confidence that you can do this type of an exam via telepractice. Um, it might be tricky with your younger ones, but the throat scope makes it so much easier. Make it fun. Get some games out. Get some hand puppets out. Just get them comfortable with looking at you in the screen. Um, you know, make them comfortable with maybe having the throat scope and looking inside their puppet's mouth. And then, oh, now it's your turn. Let's look in your mouth. And let me tell you, they will like looking at themselves in the screen as well. And that will give you a lot of information. So those are my tips for doing an oral facial exam in person and via telepractice. Um, throat scope, thank you so much. And once again, the bundle is my oral facial exam plus the starter pack of the throat scope and a box of 50 one time use depressors. Um, and you get 10% off. I don't know if I mentioned that before, but 10% off with promo code AMY10. So A M Y 10. You get 10% off. And I don't run sales on my, <laughs> on my oral facial exam. So get it. And I don't think a throat scope does either. So get it now. I think it's a great bundle. This is really to do a thorough oral facial exam. All you need is my exam and the throat scope. That's it. You don't need anything else. So I hope this has been informative. And if I have any more questions, I see them later. Um, I'll, I'll go back on the page and answer them. But thanks for having me, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.